Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and here we are today ready to do a little bit of gamma spectroscopy, isotope detection if you like. We are going to determine the characteristics of cobalt-60, which is this little guy right here. These are two check sources I have. This one is cesium-137 for calibration. Um, this one is cobalt-60, which is what we're going to be looking at. Both of these are about the same activity, meaning the same number of decays per second, which is approximately 37,000 decays per second each. The cobalt-60 I have here comes with a calibration uh, piece of paper, a certificate, showing that it, is, it has been uh, calibrated, or essayed if you like, to a 95% accuracy based on a NIST traceable source. But anyhow, <clears throat> we're going to look at these two guys right here, and I'm going to be doing this for several different isotopes, probably about 10 or 15, 10 or 15 of them over the next few uh, weeks. I'm going to be using different detectors uh, for, for many of them. For example, this one's going to be using the Spectrum Techniques detector. I'll be using the uh, B, B Research detector for one, I'll be using the Polymaster for another, and so on. To start out with, let me explain the detector, and then we're going to um, do our analysis. This is a, a, a multi-channel spectrum analyzer here. It's a Spectrum Techniques UCS30. That's a universal computer spectrometer, as it's called. It's capable of using many different types of detectors, it's not just the one you're seeing right here. Uh, it provides po positive or negative voltage. My unit's configured to only provide positive, but you can get it either way. And it's an actual hardware piece of machinery that does everything. You don't even need the computer connected except to see the results. The computer has to be there to see the results, but you can actually disconnect it while it's running, and this will continue to work by itself. This is a laboratory-grade piece of equipment. This is not a high-end laboratory-grade piece of equipment. I mean, it's very high quality, but it's at the lower end of the, the laboratory equipment. You'd want something like a high-energy high uh, germanium detector for hardcore food testing, but those can range up to twenty dollars and $30,000 easily. This one is significantly cheaper. This is actually still a very nice piece of equipment. It's used in a lot of radiological laboratories. And the detector connected to it is a um, Radiation Sensors SP38. <coughs> this unit right here, you can tell it's a lab grade piece of equipment because it has the high voltage and the signal separated from one another to improve uh, quality of the signal coming back. It is a 38 millimeter, 38.1 to be specific, uh, about an inch and a half, 38.1 millimeter sodium iodide detector crystal. Really good resolution on this unit. And we've stacked it full of lead. Uh, this lead unit, this uh, right here, this little donut comes with the detector itself. And this is some lead I have wrapped around the top of it. So we can put our samples in here in this graduated sample container and see them on the screen right here. Now I have uh, power is currently on and we're currently detecting activity, although we're not capturing anything right this moment. So let's calibrate this unit and then let's see what we can see. And just for giggles before we start, let's use our Ludlum Model 12 to see what we can get off of the, um, let me pull the sound off so you can hear it, off of the samples. Now you see we have a background of about 2,000 counts per minute. If I increase this to from times 10 to times 100, actually to times 1,000, that will be good enough for what we're about to test. When I put this over top of the samples, you see we go up into the thousands. 100,000, 150,000, 160,000, almost 200,000 counts per minute. We have some significant sources right here. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun. To start with, Let's remove our cesium-137, which is what I generally recommend for most people starting out for a calibration source. It's very useful, provides two good points to calibrate from. Now, it gets a little squirrely when the energy goes above the maximum energy of this, but that's all right, I'll show you how to do that. We're gonna take these two guys right here, stick them on a little testing uh, uh, tray, stick that in here. I have a fruit fly flying around me. Apparently the fruit fly has come so that it can see the experiment. That or maybe it wants to get gamma radiation so it can become humongous and, and powerful. Of course, that's not how that actually works. But these are emitting gamma radiation right now. So let's move this away so it doesn't interfere with our calibration. And uh, we're going to calibrate and see what we get. All right, so here we go. We have 1,024 channels that 
pulses that are detected will be dropped into. Once we figure out where the two primary peaks for cesium-137 exist, we can assign energies to those channels and then calculate the rest of them. Now, we have high voltage set at 650 volts positive, which is pretty good for this detector. And for detectors, you should always check the manual to see. The coarse gain and fine gain, these adjust the, the, the distribution of the energy across the channels. And I've already pre-configured these to where I think they need to be. But I'll, I'll show you in a few moments how you can do that yourself. All right, we're going to start out. Um, we're in logarithmic mode right this moment, I believe. Let's see. Yes, we're in logarithmic mode. So zero counts per channel, 16 counts, 256, 4,000, 64,000, 1 million, 16 million counts. If we switch over to linear, then we just go 8 counts, 16, 24, 32, and so on. And we'll, we'll max that out in a few seconds. So let's go back to logarithmic. Now let's start this and see what we get. Now you can immediately see the gamma energies building up. Let's change the, um, let's see, where will we see it? Display pixel size. Let's switch to three pixels so we can see a little easier. There it is. These little red things right here, there's a blue one and a green one, are places that I've already designated as being regions of interest. Now I can clear them. I can't do it yet. It won't let me do that until I built up a spectrum. As you can see, the spectrum is forming pretty quickly. This is a classic cesium-137 spectrum, by the way, too. Uh, this is the primary peak right here at 662 kiloelectron volts, plus or minus. It's actually 661.6x, but we'll call it 662. And this little guy over here at 32, and these are gonna, these are going to be our two data points for calibration. Uh, later on, probably not this video, but a different video, I'm going to do CZ-137, and I'll explain what all the rest of this stuff means, because you'll probably want to know that at some point. So let's stop this. All right. Right-click, go to Regions of Interest, and clear all Regions of Interest, because we want to set some new ones. And we are going to grab a hold with the mouse, and you can actually set the numbers in, but you can also do it with the mouse. And normally I can do it really well, but I'm doing this with a, a little scratch and sniff mouse pad, so I'm not doing the greatest job. So let's select that for region of interest one. This is for 32 kilo electron volts. And now let's select region of interest two. This is for the 662 kV. So we have two data points. And when you have two data points in an XY graph, you can then figure out the rest of the data points. Now this graph is not actually going to be linear like this. Change in energy over, over channel will not be linear. It actually curves. So this is not going to be completely accurate, but it'll be good enough to give us an idea of what we're looking at. So let's calibrate this thing. We're going to go up to Settings, Energy Calibration. We're going to use a two-point calibration as opposed to a three. And by the way, with cesium-137, it can actually auto-calibrate, but we're going to do it manually. Two-point calibration. The units down here at the bottom, we could be in thousands of electron volts. We could be in electron volts. We could be in kiloelectron volts. It's thousands of electron volts. We could be in millions of electron volts. Heck, if we had the right equipment, we could be in giga electron volts or even tera electron volts, but we're not that cool. We're going to be in kilo electron volts, thousands of electron volts, okay? So <clears throat> each little one of these 1,024 channels will be set to electron, uh, 1,000 electron volts plus or minus each. So let's start out. Right here is the first place in the centroid that means the, you can see it on the screen, it shows centroid. Centroid is the um, center of this uh, of the mathematical statistical, if you like, center of this uh, region of interest, and that is set to 16. So channel 16, there it goes, it sh says 16. We know that our, our energy is going to be 32 kiloelectron volts set. Now for this next one right here, we see the centroid is 394. Let's put our mouse in there. 394. So dead on top of that, and we know that the energy for that is about 662 kilo electron volts. So we set it, and now we're set all the way across, as you can see. And it looks like we're going anywhere from around 4 or 5 kilo electron volts all the way up to 1,712. We could make this wider if we wanted to, but it requires various things done to do that. Now, so let's clear the spectrum and calculate it again. And we're going to see if we have this about right. And as you can see, looking at the centroid, it's staying right around 662. If we click on this particular region of interest, we can see its information down here. So I think we're calibrated well enough to start out with a very simple analysis of 
Cobalt 60. So let's stop what we're doing, clear it. I'm going to remove the Cobalt 60 from the tray, and I'm going to, or the, excuse me, the cesium 137 from the tray, and I'm going to add the Cobalt 60. So we're going to pull that out. You can't see what I'm doing because I'm doing it elsewhere, but you'll have to trust me. I'm putting the Cobalt 60 in the tray, placing it in the tray holder. All right, and now we're ready to go. Start volt, uh, start accumulation, and we'll let this cobalt 60 build up. Now, if anybody knows anything about cobalt 60, you should already see cobalt 60 forming. Right here, you can see the two peaks for it. I'll explain in a moment what that does because, honestly put, it gets kind of complicated. So, let's give this two or three minutes to form by itself. Okay, so we've given this a few seconds and it's formed pretty nicely. Let's switch from a logarithmic view to a linear view. And as you can see, it's already filled the screen up when I hit the button switch. I'm going to use the up arrow that's changing the counts on the side here. If you look closely, you can see. And I can adjust this to fit what I want, which should be right here. Now we can see we're building pretty nicely. We're going to go back and give that a few more moments to build up and we'll give it to 300 seconds, okay? Okay, so as you can see, we're, we have a really good spectrum. Let's stop the accumulation. Don't click this button, it'll erase the spectrum. Okay, now what we're going to do is go to ROIs, the regions of interest, and we're going to clear all regions of interest because we don't need to see them for this. See this down here? What happened is this went over the top and actually started bleeding into the bottom. So let's hit the up arrow and smooth that out a little. And in fact, speaking of smoothing, let's smooth the entire spectrum. There we go, three point smooth. This is a cobalt 60 spectrum. Can we, no, I guess we're gonna have to leave it like that. Okay, now let me explain cobalt 60 to you for a second. Cobalt 60 is a beta decaying, a negative beta decaying isotope. That means that one of its neutrons decays into a proton, and as a result of that decay, it loses a little bit of mass, which is shot off as energy. In the case of this uh, uh, atom here, it would be a beta minus, which is an electron. And it's fired off at pretty high speed. And the result is the cobalt-60 turns into nickel-60. Now, when it transitions to nickel-60, it almost immediately has to release a lot of energy, and it shoots that energy off as a gamma ray. Now, there are two different possible configurations of this decay that it can do and they result in two completely different gamma rays. And as you can see here, they are right there. These are primary photo peaks. Photo peak is a peak of, um, uh, uh, produced by the actual gamma ray hitting the, detect the crystal detector. These are the two primaries right here. Let's highlight them. There's number one. The smooth goes away when I highlight them. That's why it got kind of rough there. And here's number two. All right, now let's see if we can compare these to the energies that are in the, that are uh, normally associated with um, cobalt 60 and see if they match up. All right, <clears throat> I'll explain what all of these guys are here in a minute, but let's start with the two primary photo peaks. This guy right here, according to the spectrometer's calibration, is occurring at approximately 1,122.474 kilo electron volts. The real energy that this should be is 1,173.24. So we're off by about 50,000 electron volts, which is not very much. This is pretty, pretty, pretty close to dead on. Now this peak right here is listed at 1,258.84 kilo electron volts. The real energy that it should be is 
So this one's off a little more, and the reason is is because the original calibration we did was somewhere over here, the, the highest number was somewhere over here in the 600s. Let's see where it is. 6, 662, right? Let's find that. So right here is where the highest energy was in the original calibration. And so it becomes less and less and less accurate as it moves on this direction. So we're off a little bit. If we were going to actually search a sample to see if it had cobalt-60, we would want to calibrate with this cobalt-60 sample to be more specific. And we could change our calibration to be exact if we wanted to. Now, <clears throat> these two are the primary photo peaks. This is the cobalt-60 gammas. They're actually nickel gammas. The gamma rays come from actually from nickel-60 uh, as the uh, cobalt-60 decays into nickel. But there are a few other things that we can see in the spectrum. These other things, we need to look at these and figure out what they are. Well, first off, let's look at this. This is the first most prominent thing, I think. This should be around 70 to 80, and it is. It's at 78 kilo electron volts. This is actually actually X-ray fluorescence. You know, like when you shine a black light against a, something that's white, and you see that shine that comes back at you? Well, what's happening is these powerful gamma rays right here are actually hitting the lead shielding and reflecting back. Uh, well, they don't reflect back. It's actually fluorescence. The atom releases X-rays that are around uh, 75 and 80 kilo electron volts, and here they are. This is actually caused by the lead shielding. Isn't that amazing? As a result of this, you can actually shine the um, cobalt-60 against an object and look to see for this peak, and you could actually determine if objects had lead in them using this, or any other element for that matter, because all elements uh, emit x-rays, characteristic x-rays, as a result of uh, high-energy bombardment. This is called x-ray uh, fluoroscopy. So that's what this guy is right here. Uh, there actually are a bunch of x-rays that are emitted by nickel-60 as, as cobalt-60 decays into it, but the majority of these are very low in energy and either found way below where we can see, or they're found over here where they're being masked by whatever this big bump is, and I'll explain to you what it is in a minute. I know exactly what it is. Okay, so what happens when a photon hits the crystal and bounces back, losing energy before it's detected? or it hits the de uh, crystal detector and is, is reflected at some angle that's less than perfect before being detected. Well, it loses energy when it does this, and as a result of it, you end up with this entire area here. Let me show it to you. This whole area is something called a Compton Plateau. It's where gamma rays have actually hit the crystal. Gamma rays from these two right here have hit the crystal, but they've ricocheted around before they actually were absorbed before they were detected, if you like, by the crystal, and they reduced energy as they hit things, they attenuated. Basically, the gamma ray hits something and reflects at a slight angle and loses energy, and you end up with this whole entire plateau, if you like, of the, the ricocheted energies from these. You have the Compton peak, or the Compton edge right here. This is the Compton edge. This is where it kind of falls off and ends, the Compton edge, because it, there's, mathematically you don't really get any past this because you're getting the primary photo peak. The Compton um, peak is right here. This is the uh, uh, these are photons that are only ever so slightly uh, reflected. Then you end up with the backscatter peak all the way back here. These are the uh, photons that got nearly 100% knocked in reverse. They hit the crystal and just bounced right back. There's actually a third form of peak we can look at called a sum peak. That's what happens when a photon that makes this peak and a photon that makes this peak are both detected at the same time. And that's over this way. And let's switch to logarithmic view and see if we can see it. It would be the sum of this plus this. And it's not here in the spectrum because it would be too far to the uh, right. But it normally does exist. So let's switch back to linear. I'm going to show you now a mathematically solved chart that I made that's a much better quality um, spectrum than this, which actually shows all of these completely solved for you to look at. Cobalt-60 is an amazing isotope because it's a very powerful gamma emitter. It's used for sterilization of food, uh, sterilization of medical equipment. Um, there are a bunch of people that used to think they could be used in cobalt, uh, cobalt nuclear warheads long ago, but it turns out that that's not really very beneficial at all. So if anybody has ever heard of a cobalt bomb, it turns out those are no good for anything. Uh, although the government did look at those for a little while. It was an interesting idea. So typically it's just used in the uh, food irradiation and medical industry. And when you have uh, food that's been irradiated, this is exactly the isotope they usually use to do it. Sometimes they use other ones, but this is typically the one because it's such a high uh, photon energy. So let's look now at that solved chart. And then there you go. 
All right, so this right here is the actual spectrum. Basically what you saw a few minutes ago, what we've been looking at, except this one I did a really good job at. This one I ran for several hours. Uh, I did it inside of a lead testing chamber, a full lead castle. It's the same equipment that you saw in the video, though. It's the same, the same source. In fact, there's the actual source on the side. You can see them on the right. This is the entire spectrum completely laid out, starting from the right, uh, sorry, excuse me, starting from the left and moving right, you'll see I have x-rays from the detector, uh, the, the actual lead shielding of the detector. Moving over next, I have the back scatter peaks. Remember I told you this is when the photons get reflected basically completely backwards. And you can see I have uh, predicted, mathematically predicted numbers, and then I have what I detected. It's the calibration that makes the difference. And several pieces of, several aspects of the detector which make a difference as well. <clears throat> In the very middle of, uh, in between the uh, Compton Peak and the Backscatter Peak, there's an Annihilation Peak. That's actually created by uh, 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 antiparticles that are created from the high-energy gammas. So that's quite impressive, actually, that this thing can do that. You see the Compton Peaks. Uh, the reason I have two Compton Edge, uh, the reason I have two Compton Peaks, and the reason I have two Backscatter Peaks is because I have two primary photo peaks. And if you look over to slightly past the middle, heading towards the right, you'll see the Nickel one, the Nickel 60. Uh, which is the decay product, you'll see that I have 1173.24 keV and I have uh, 1332.5 keV. Those are the two primary photo peaks and those little percentages, the 99.97 and 99.99, are how, how often that gamma ray occurs every single time this uh, isotope decays. Then moving to the very, very, very right of the actual uh, spectrum, the very right, you can actually see the beginning of the sum peak at 2505.74 keV. This occurs when both gammas are actually detected at the same time, which is amazing that it does that. This is a, a slightly broader range that I took with the same detector and equipment as before. Now what you're actually starting to hear right now is the sound of the spectrum. Using my Gamma Spectacular, a different uh, unit that I didn't show in this video, I was actually able to capture the sound spectrum. It's the same spectrum you're seeing here, but recorded in sound where low sounds, the low sounds, are coming from lower energy, and the high sounds are coming from higher energy. That was a compliment of me. But anyway, so sit back and listen to about a minute or so of Cobalt 60 and watch the spectrum, listen to the sounds it makes, and then that's the end of the video. So sit back, listen, and enjoy.